Good morning, everyone, and welcome to session two of the 60th Annual Seminar on Glass. I'm Carol Ann Fabian at the Corning Museum of Glass, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this session on Chinese reverse painted glass, a closer look. We'll have two speakers today. I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the um, program and then introduce each of our speakers and they'll uh, present in sequence. Um, please do enter any questions you have as, as you think of them into the chat or the Q&A and uh, I'll be watching those and we'll pose the questions to the speakers at the end of the session. Um, so uh, not to take too much more time on the uh, fundamentals of how this works, I'll uh, just give you a brief introduction to the session. In the 18th to 19th century, Chinese artists working in painting workshops specializing in goods for the Western market were famous for their skill at reverse painting on glass. The images these artists painted were often copies of works by other artists. The Corning Museum's reverse painted portrait of George Washington is one such example. A copy of Gilbert Stuart's now iconic image of our nation's first president a complicated character who for many represents the Republic itself, while for others represents the enslaver and destroyer of native lands and people. This session examines the artistic and social context of these extraordinary reverse painted works by Chinese artists, as well as considers the interpretation and display of challenging figures such as George Washington in contemporary museum settings. Our speakers today are Dr. Maggie Chow, and Assistant Professor of Art History at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a scholar of 18th and 19th century American art in a global context. Her research focuses on the history of globalization with particular interest in intersections of art with histories of technology, natural science, and economics. She is author of The End of Landscape in 19th Century America, and she's also published on topics including the print culture of 18th century financial bubbles and the place of scrimshaw in ecological and economic histories of the globe. Dr. Cow will be uh, followed by Dr. Carrie Sinanin, who is a professor at the assistant professor at the University of Texas at San Antonio and specializes in the cultures of the Black Atlantic and Middle Passage. She is completing her monograph on enslavers of the 18th century entitled Myths of Mastery, Traders, Planters, and Colonial Agents, 1750 to 1834, and has also published widely on Black Atlantic writers and texts. She is currently vice president of the Early Caribbean Society and last year was awarded the Rakow Fellowship to research further on glass race and slavery in the Enlightenment. We are so delighted to have collaborated with both um, Maggie and Carrie on a variety of projects, including our uh, exhibition that's on view now at the museum. And it is my pleasure to turn it now over to Dr. Uh, Maggie Cow. Thanks everyone. Thanks Carol and for the introduction. Um, I think I, uh, slides should be, I have some slides that are going to be up in a minute, um, but it's been uh, terrific. Um, I um, will give you, I, I will be talking about Chinese reverse painted glass from a more technical perspective, and um, Carrie's going to sort of think about how we deal with these objects today. Uh, so in, in 1802, the Philadelphia portraitist Gilbert Stewart was dismayed to discover that his lucrative business in painting portraits. Oh, may I advance my own slides? Sorry. Just give me a next, please. Oh, Maggie. okay. Well, you okay. should indicate next, Maggie. Yes. Oh, okay. Um, can I have the next slide? Um, so in 18, I'll just start again, if you could just advance to the next slide, thanks. Um, so in 1802, the Philadelphia portraitist Gilbert Stewart was quite dismayed to discover that his lucrative business of painting portraits of George Washington was being undercut by a local merchant of the China trade. This merchant named John E. Sword was a sea captain who had recently returned from Canton and was selling other portraits that look quite like these. Next slide, please. And then, thanks. Um, though these are not by the American artist's hand, court records 
from the ensuing lawsuit indicate that Sword had purchased an authentic Stuart portrait, like the ones you saw on the last slide, the year before and had taken it to China for the purpose of uh, procuring, procuring one of several hundred, 100 copies um, of Stuart's portrait, these being three of them, by Chinese artists in order to profit from their sale back in America. There's something about this story that rings true for our globalized present. When made in China has certain connotations that are mostly negative. Can I have the next slide, please? Associated with questionable labor practices and counterfeiting. If we were to tell the story of Sword's investment in uh, Sword's uh, portraits take, made in China, then we might update it with today's terminology saying, um, and it would go something like this, Sword's entrepreneurial ambitions drove him to seek offshore production that replaced Gilbert Stewart's originality and craftsmanship with the thoughtless and cheap labor of anonymous copyists. But the story is not so straightforward. Not only was Stewart's own work centered on entrepreneurial copying, next slide please, there are some 75 portraits. Oh, I think there, uh, sorry, could you go to the next slide? Thanks. Um, so Stewart's own work was centered on entrepreneurial copying. There are some 75, 75 versions in his own hand of the first president's visage each copied from an original unfinished canvas, which you see here on the left, done during a 1796 sitting with the president. Each copy that he made thereafter, he sold for $100 a piece, a nice bargain considering, you know, he didn't have to spend so much labor on each of those. But let's set aside Stewart's own practice of replication for profit for now and turn to the artisans in China employed by Sword. Next slide. If we look carefully at the artifacts implicated in the story itself, the reverse paintings on glass, a medium highly prized by Western consumers of Chinese goods, we will find a very te a technically sophisticated articulation of what it means to copy. Next slide, please. Between 1757 and 1842, when Canton or present day Guangzhou, you can see the location of Canton on the map on the left there um, in, the, uh, in South China. And um, you can see a map of Canton, the city on the right. Uh, during this period, Canton was the sole port of international trade in China. And there a sizable art market emerged in the city's foreign quarter. So on this map of Canton, you'll see a ring, a blue ring that actually represents the walled city itself. And um, on the, this map, the foreign quarters was actually on the lower section where it's marked B. Um, so it, there, it was actually very quite a small part of the city. It wasn't integrated into the main city itself. But in this sort of foreign section of the city, um, it was estimated that by 1822, there were some 5,000 shops and studios in the vicinity of the foreign factories where uh, the foreign factories were was where official trade happened, trade for things like tea and silk. Um, and in this vicinity, there were all of these studios where um, these officers and merchants who were coming from overseas would reside during the trading season. And during their, that time, they would patronize these shops for various wares. Uh, next, next slide. Canton's many artists were regularly charged with replicating foreign artifacts in the same or another medium. So um, uh, porcelain, the, on the left you see porcelain plates which have been um, on, onto which a, a craftsman has painted, um, has copied a book plate design. Um, other examples of Chinese export wares might be hardwood furniture, which would be made from prototypes or uh, copied um, from actual furniture, and there would be entire sets of these. Painting operated much like these other crafts, with large workshops offering combination of ready-made goods for purchase, as well as custom commissions. Next slide. <clears throat> 
As the art historian Winnie Wong has shown, the 18th century practice of Western cell paintings marks the beginning of a long tradition in China's Pearl River Delta, today the largest production center for handmade oil paintings. That's the subject of this really fantastic book um, that you see here. So my talk builds on Wang's insight that export painting, both historical and present day, problematizes notions of authorship, originality, and authenticity. Next slide. The artists who painted these Washington portraits likely did not share in Western understandings of the copy, but these paintings nevertheless participated in a richly developed concept of reproduction born of the cross-cultural context of Canton's workshops. Since export painting was largely an anonymous practice documented by the foreigners who purchased them, much is lost about the social realities of these artisans' shops. Nevertheless, we can work to recover in surviving artifacts like these, the maker's understanding of how, what they understood when they were making reproductions. Specifically, what I would like to propose today is that reverse painting on glass, a medium decidedly associated with the China trade and notably favored for replicating Western art, became for the export painters in Canton a sophisticated medium for making sense of the copy. So to understand this, we really need to get technical with this medium. Next slide. Reverse painted glass is a type of oil painting done on the back of flat glass panels. Once framed, it was then viewed from the unpainted side. Its key characteristics are glossy crystalline color and an appearance of fluidity bordering on wetness. Although a specialty of export painting workshops, neither oil paint nor glass were native to China. Both were likely introduced a century earlier by Jesuits at the Imperial Court. But by the 1750s, glass painting had migrated to Canton where it grew in tandem with East-West maritime trade. While the medium itself has its origins in rural glass production regions in Europe, reverse painted glass reached its most technical and advanced articulation in Canton's export art studios striving there even despite geographical and material odds. Next slide. Um, so this is a, a kind of um, image from the period of these various studios. So, and I say that they, it, it thrived despite the odds because um, high quality sheet glass, uh, panels of glass, not sheet glass in the contemporary sense, but panels, flat panels of glass, were not produced at the time in China. So despite its fragility, even in shipping overseas, the glass actually had to be imported in order to be painted. So you can imagine just the extent to which uh, efforts went into um, uh, sort of these artisans developing this medium to the degree to which they did. The unlikely flourishing of glass painting as a medium of replication in the maritime world cannot then be separated from other forms of global circulation, especially of portable art forms such as prints. In the decades around 1800, when that Washington portrait was painted, there were off, more often prints and not paintings that actually served as the models for which Chinese artists were um, using to depict non-native subjects. Next slide. In this example of uh, another example of Washingtonia, um, a popular memorial engraving showing the president's apotheosis, uh, we can see that the Chinese artist clearly translated the print into a painting, which is on the right, the print on the left. Um, and, uh, and this is sort of the the, the standard process by which these glass paintings were made of Western subjects was that a print would have been imported to, to be copied and then they would be made into paintings. It was rare for Western merchants to actually bring full scale oil paintings as Soar did with his Stuart portrait, though it was common for export artists in Canton to execute multiple copies from the same source artifact as with the Washington portraits, proliferating many, many copies. And copies of the Washington portrait, next slide, 
are in many institutions, including Corning's, where and the Corning example is featured in the current past present exhibition, um, the water damage prevents it from being hung upright, as you can see there. Despite the overwhelming tendency of Western observers to dismiss Chinese artists as mere servile imitators, and that's a quote, glass painters were keenly aware of the implications of copying. Their paintings manage a complex relationship between painting and model. Next slide. And I want to think about that relationship specifically through this example, because it's, uh, it's one in which um, the questions of source image and originality and uh, um, replication are quite potent. So this example, some of you in the audience may recognize as resembling Francois Boucher's 1759 painting of Jupiter and Calypso. Next slide, which you'll see in a minute. Yeah, that's the, that's the Boucher painting. But to create the glass painting, the Chinese artist worked actually not from this Boucher, but from a print, next slide, by René Gaillard, who engraved the paint, who made an engraving after the, the original Boucher. And it was this engraving that would have been brought to China in order to be translated into, onto a painting on glass. So the, the glass painter would have been translating from print to painting, from line to color, from paper to glass, making all of these shifts along the way. As the name reverse painting on glass suggests, this medium of, uh, and this process of translation involved a series of inversions, which I want to go into detail here about what exactly is inverted. What, a, what exactly about reverse painted glass is actually reversed? So the first of these reversals is a left-right reversal, or the composing of paintings as mirror images of their models. Because the painter worked on a transparent support, he could easily copy uh, his source from the beginning. So he would be tracing the print onto the glass sheet that could be laid directly over it. So in many cases, these are one-to-one -one size reproductions. Yet, in order to refer to, in order to render the finished painting in the correct orientation, you see that the figures are facing the same way here. Um, he could no longer continue to work this way, uh, you know, in as he continues to paint. So the in order to complete the painting, the painter actually has to turn the glass over after tracing and fill in a now reversed composition freehand from sight. Next slide. In this Chinese watercolor documenting the process, you can see the original frame print hanging before the artist who is shown painting on a horizontal glass surface. The composition on which he is working is flipped left to right. The foliage on the right of the print ends up on the left side of the copy. Thus, any detail from the figure's orientation to written inscriptions had to be rendered in mirror image. In its requirement for reversal, the practice of painting on glass shares in the logic of printmaking in which a plate or a block also generates mirror images. Next slide. Next slide, okay, thanks. Um, so here you can see a plate from at which the print was made and how the printmaker would also have to have written say in mirror writing. Um, so, uh, Yet despite shared technical strategies, printmaking and reverse glass painting occupy opposite ends of a spectrum of reproducibility. So while printmaking is a mechanical process to, uh, of image propagation, so in other words, a printmaker takes usually will copy, a printmaker making a copy of a painting, the objective is to make many, many, many copies that are exactly identical of a singular object. The reverse painted glass is a manual process for turning multiples, usually prints, which are the sources, into singular paintings, unique um, objects. Indeed, glass paintings tend to bear an uncanny resemblance to the unseen paintings on which the prints were based. Next slide, as is the case with the Boucher that I uh, showed here. Next slide. <clears throat> 
Exactly. So you see the original painting and the glass painting have a kind of affinity, even though the print, the glass painter would never have seen the original painting. Thus, the replica on glass constitutes a strange return to originality, something that would have been favored by Western consumers. Next slide. Glass paintings may best be conceptualized as copies in reverse. Their production involved not only a physical, but also a temporal inversion of its closest artistic relative, oil on canvas, which the same artist also produced. Since the image on glass is rendered on what is technically the back of the support, the back of the glass, not the side that you see actually, artists had to start by painting the finest details closest to the surface before gradually working backward toward the background. This means that details such as what you see here, the, the jeweled crown that the one of the figures is wearing, the highlights on the drapery um, that you see, those would have been the first marks set down on the glass, while the background, the clouds, the, the shadows, the shadowy pool, the leaves, um, those would likely have been the last to have been painted. To copy a source image in this inverted fashion requires a sort of mastery that can be hard to imagine. Next slide. Play the video, please. So um, this video, which is kind of a YouTube viral sensation, um, allows you to kind of get a visual sense of how difficult it is to paint in this backwards fashion, working from foreground to background. Next slide. So you can imagine that culinary, culinary virtuoso type of display, just how difficult it is to actually see the image once you've started reproducing it. Um, and that same logic works with pigment on a glass surface. So you can sort of, I'm hoping that you can get a sense of the, how the protocol of working backward actually counteracts the very material advantages of oil painting as a medium, which is that this is a medium that um, was prized for the fact that you can build subtle contours through layering and for you know being able to revise what you had done through overpainting. So in other words, the very the very strengths of using oil paint are um, undone by the very process of painting on glass. So um, here, even the subtlest highlights had to be planned out, planned out in advance, thus precluding compositional improvisation, improvisation and correction. In effect, glass transforms oil paint from a flexible medium, something that you can easily edit and change into an obstinate one that is sort of once it's there, it's, it's done. With its systems of reversals, glass painting was most successful if work from existing images, which provide a spatial and temporal roadmap for execution. Even export paintings of other subjects were, were produced as replicas of existing originals. In other words, they were often done through the process of copying, even if the design itself was not uh, a sourced from the outside. Um, so, you know, there were glass paintings made of uh, Chinese motifs that were also repeated again and again. Next slide. One example is um, there are many glass paintings like the one on the upper left that you see um, of the, the foreign factories, the waterfront showing all the trade houses. And this was a type of image that is replicated in a range of different mediums in the export art market uh, in Canton because it was sort of, even though this was an original uh, design idea, it was something that was also subject to replication and therefore ideal for glass painting. What sets glass apart from other surfaces that also serve as a ground for copied images, such as these, is the rigid protocols that paradoxically distance the original from copy. So rather than promoting rote replication, the technical demands of reverse painted glass actually serves to constantly distance the original from the copy. And this is where I see um, an the artists of glass of, of reverse glass in China really asserting their own creativity. 
Manual copying requires an artist to constantly compare the imitation to the reference. So really looking between the model and the replica constantly as you, as you create your replication. But this feedback loop would not have been available to painters on class who had to work on doubly inverted images. Moreover, as the layers of paint build up, background covering foreground, so too many of the original tracings and earlier marks, such as the details of the highlights, would have been overwritten and obliterated, resulting in a double erasure. Inherent to glass painting, then, is a tension between tracing and painting, mechanization and creative labor. As a result, complex images um, tend to break down at the edges of the work. Next slide. Here, for example, you see that uh, the final layers added at the later stages of a painting's progressive um, creation. So for instance, like the foliage you'll see um, around the figures that there is a kind of dissolution of certain details, such as uh, the putti that you see, the little angels in the tree, um, as well as, um, you know, that, that they just kind of meld into the drapery there. Um, so even though these details would have been uh, essential to the mythological narrative in the Western context, they become sort of the details that are ignored because the process of copying kind of focuses so much on central figures. So not surprisingly, the Chinese glass paintings most true to their models were portraits. Next slide. A Western genre that very clearly, oh, sorry, next slide. Um, so in portraits, you find a Western genre that most clearly communicates its point of focus at the center, which would have been ideal for this process of reverse painted glass. The glass painters of Canton were not just copyists, but thoughtful practitioners of what it means to reproduce. So mastering the technical complexity of this medium um, also made them very self-conscious about their enterprise. And this is where I, I really um, want to show just the extent to which these artisans were thinking creatively about the process of replication. Next slide. Take, for instance, this Chinese made cabinet. Next slide. Yeah, and this, this cabinet. It's decorated with twinned images painted on glass on the doors, showing a scene. Um, depicting Pizarro in the New World. One image is the mirror image of the other. The Chinese painter here was working from a mezzotint by William Orm. Next slide. So um, the mezzotint on the right, that was the source image. Um, and making a copy of this mezzotint, not once, but twice, but in one copy, the replication is in the correct orientation, the same as the print, and then the other copy, it's the reverse of it. The doubling here creates a visual symmetry on the doors of the cabinet, but also it points to the painter's own procedures. In other words, it preserves the marks of reversal through a a deliberate collapsing of replication and reflection. Um, in other words, the material contradictions of glass and the technical complexities of painting in reverse were also in this art form a source of its intelligence. This same visual play animates an entire subset of paintings that were literally made on mirrors. Next slide. So mirrors, of course, were simply glass panels coated on the reverse with silver. So to paint scenes like these, and it's hard to tell that these are actually mirrors, but all the dark and silvery sections that you see in the background of these two paintings is actually a mirror. So if you were to walk in front of it, you would see a reflection. Um, so the painted scenes here uh, the, the artist ma has made the painting by selectively scraping away the silver coating and adding paint in its place. By intentionally and strategically manipulating the inherent reflectivity of their support, mirror paintings reference not only their own making, but also the very circulating artifacts that serve as models for their production. And it's a very kind of self-conscious 
assertion of how to use the mirror. So in the one on the left, this painting on the left, you actually see a mirror being represented on a wall using actually mirror, actual silver mirroring as the surface of the mirror. It's that gold framed object on the wall there. Next slide. Next slide. And sometimes this sophisticated self-referencing can be quite uh, intelligent in that this example, for example, uh, for, for example, in this scene of a Chinese scholar, the artist has rendered a small mirror on the bookshelf with a circular patch of reserved silvering. And you see that, um, it's kind of hard to tell, but it's on the right edge of the painting, just near the fringe of the curtains. So this silvering, I think, would have once covered the entire sheet, but then becomes reserved. And it actually, beyond that little circle, the left background, sort of beyond the pavilion columns, is also silver, is also reserved silvering, so also mirrored. Um, so what you see here is that despite the diminutive size of that little circular mirror, it's actually really important to the composition. It catches the glints of light and echoes the shape of the prominent medallion with the still life in it that you see in the upper arch. More importantly, which is something you would not notice unless you can see this in person, which I did at the Peabody Essex Museum, um, if you walk up to the painting, um, you will and begin to look at it and look into that mirror, what you see is actually your own eye reflected back from that small round mirror. This startling return of the gaze restages a kind of confrontation a viewer may have had with a familiar portable artifact of the period, the eye miniature. Next slide. Oh, sorry, that there's a detail of the mirror. Next slide. Yeah, this, this is an example of an eye miniature. Eye miniatures were briefly fashionable in Europe during the height of glass picture production in Canton. And these handheld objects, so this is a, in the form of a pin, but sometimes they were also pendants, grew out of a much older tradition of painted portrait, portrait miniatures, which were bejeweled watercolor and ivory likenesses often used to uh, exchange between friends and family members um, as a, a show of um, intimacy. Next slide. So an example of one such miniature. Um, though subject to the same patterns of sentimental circulation as miniature portraits, paintings of eyes, as Hanukkah Grote Bauer has argued, were not so much representations of part of a face, but of the gaze, one that turns the spectator into an object on view and under watch. So here, next slide. So here in this, uh, in this glass painting, the artist's installation of a mirror in the form as, as a kind of stand-in for the eye miniature speaks to cross-cultural interaction as well as the reality of circulating artifacts for the reproductive practices of export painting. The traffic of small likenesses, these very lightweight artworks that were made for travel, far extended that of actual persons in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, particularly in the highly gendered world of the mercantile trading ventures in Canton. So Chinese artists thus developed a deep familiarity with miniatures of all sorts, having used them to create two scale or enlarged portraits. Next slide. And these are all made by Chinese artisans in the export trade. So they themselves made miniatures, but also enlarged miniatures into large, into full-size portraits and took the faces off of miniatures to sort of recreate them in the form of other compositions, as you see in the center. The limitations of painting for miniatures is often evidence in full-size portraits, for example, where you, and often there are women because there weren't, women were not allowed into Canton's sort of trading quarters. Um, and so because of their absence, any painter who would have been replicating an image of a female sitter would have been using a source image like a miniature. In glass and mirror paintings, miniatures were both prototypes and pictorial subjects. Next slide. 
In this export cupboard and writing desk, for example, the viewer is invited to turn his or her own reflection into a miniature portrait. The cupboard door is fitted with a glass painting with an allegorical figure at the center holding out an oval mirror, and she thus invites the user of the desk to fit one's own face, the viewer's face, into that frame that she's holding. Next slide. Though represented at a larger scale and size than an actual miniature, the mirror medallion of this painting is nevertheless styled as such. It's actually, if you look closely, suspended from a gold chain, just like the jewelry pieces um, that were actual miniatures would have been uh, used. So you see on the left, um, the kind of hole that allows you to turn that miniature into a pendant and the actual miniature shows a woman holding a miniature, which is on a chain. Um, it is significant too that this type of furniture, uh, this, the desk, right, is a secretaire, a body sized desk with a single writing surface that pulls in and folds out. Um, and it was in, actually invented during the second half of the 18th century. So it's a kind of a novel furniture item specifically for, for correspondence. So you would sit at this desk to write letters. So in other words, the setting of the glass painting about the mobility of goods, the transit of these small objects was actually um, placed within a, a, an object that in which a, a user would be, you, you would be writing letters, thus thinking about exchange over long distances. And indeed the glass painting invites the distant correspondent to take part in reproducing one's own image in reverse. And this is exactly what another merchant uh, named Andreas van Bramhukist did when he commissioned likely the same export art studio to paint a variation of this mirror image that you see here um, as a standalone painting. Next slide. So in this example, you see that the painting is kind of a, is, is inserted into a piece of furniture as a decorative object. Next slide. But in this version on the right, it's a standalone painting, which is the later commission, which I want to talk about. Um, so here, what you see is that this, this China trader, um, Andreas Hukis, has uh, essentially uh, requested a copy of this original um, mirror painting that was in the desk. Um, but instead of using an actual, instead of having that medallion be an actual mirror as it was in the original the first version, he's replaced that, he's requested that it be replaced by a portrait of his own wife, um, almost certainly copied from an actual miniature. Taken as a whole, the painting is a meditation on replication in the export arts. Thematizing the image is first, the technical means of painting in reverse. In other words, that the portrait is placed in a mirrored space while the silvering is maintained around it. So all the entire background and the top is a mirror. Um, so therefore engaging this as a viewer of this painting in a kind of replication reflection of himself, a kind of reverse image, looking at his own inverse, inverted image, um, allowing him to think about the process, process of reverse painting. Also central to this painting are the mobile artifacts at the root of export art production. So there's the miniature, but there's also the print. And in both of these uh, versions, you see on the lower half, a maritime scene, which is rendered on the stone pedestal, but it's painted in grisaille in this like black and white to maintain um, the fact that, to maintain the fact that these were copied from print sources. So in, in colorless print sources. So these serve both as an image copied to another medium, but also a representation of a paper print. Like next to the likely Persian carpets that this woman is sitting on is an incense burner, um, other objects essentially imported. The miniature and the printed and the print here of then appear itemized amongst an inventory of maritime commodities that connected China to the rest of the globe. In reverse paintings on glass, material experimentation, both requisite and unexpected, generated meditations on replication itself. 
In these artifacts, glass painters sought to encode doublings, reversals, and reflections that actually defined what it was to do artistic labor for them. So in the best cases, as we see here, they reproduced artworks that were highly self-reflexive of what it meant to copy for cultural others. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Maggie. Um, let's let's turn now directly to Carrie um, for her presentation, and we'll hold questions till the end. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll just wait for the slides to load. Um, so this is really a talk that considers the dynamics of reversal and perspectives alongside um, thinking about glass. Um, and I'm going to just extend it out a little bit. Dr. Chow's work urges the need. Um, can you just bring up our PowerPoint slide presentation? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Chow's work urges the need to invert our questions about originality, art, and production in order to disrupt Western models of aesthetic judgment with regard to Chinese reverse glass painting. Dr. Chell's work intersects with my own on slavery, race and glass, because in the context of racial capitalism that structured the global 18th century trade network, we can see readily, um, as we've just heard, that certain kinds of labour were valued and others not. Certain figures are visible and others are not. In our historiographies and in our exhibitions, Many of the artisans of the 18th century Atlantic world were in fact enslaved peoples. While we continue to reify in many ways the consumers and the owners of capital, the connoisseurs, the purchasers, and those who extracted the labor. My own work draws attention to the structures of racism that inhere in glass making, curation, and art historiography. We might well remember explicitly that, that was something we all know, um, that glass making as a craft began in Mesopotamia and Egypt, where Alexandria was a centre of glass manufacture in 1000 AD, in Africa, in fact. And the making of glass objects, especially beads, goes back to ancient times. So the findings at Igo, I, Ibo Wuuwu by Thurston Shaw in the 1960s revealed over 100,000 glass beads dating back to the 9th century. And of course, this excavation itself was wrapped up with colonial power structures of the town due to British imperial incursions. An example from my own research of what Dr. Chow names as the cross-cultural exchange inherent in global artistic production at this time can be seen in very glass beads that were traded in their millions on the west coast of Africa in return for enslaved people. Leaving aside the racial calculus of exchange, it is important to note, as Saul Guerrero and many others have, that these beads were not in fact the fripperies or trinkets that slave ship captains made them out to be, but highly desirable artifacts, just as they were in Europe. In fact, the designs of the Venice and Murano glass beads were deliberately made to meet the taste and cultural values of specific communities and nations in Africa. In fact, they were often reproductions of African-styled Ghanaian beads, Senegalese beads. Next slide, please. So remembering these power dynamics that construct histories of glass, I want to turn to the figure of George Washington, who was the focus, as Dr. Chow pointed out, of the recent Corning exhibition, and whose reverse glass portrait was central to telling many complex stories about Chinese reverse glass painting, about commemoration, about the founding fathers, and the work of memory and narrative that museums themselves do. I was part of the consulting team that Carol Ann Fabian put together in part of this exhibition planning for the past and present. And we had very difficult conversations about what it meant to display Washington while trying to tell a story of the damage that had been done to the reverse glass painted portrait of him when the museum was flooded in 1972. Some of us felt that we did not want the painted portrait on display as it is here alongside the glass painting. Others felt that seeing the original 
portrait was vital to tell the full story of the art and craft of the anonymous Chinese reverse painters themselves. Would the image of Washington, so familiar to everyone already, dominate? Would it overshadow the very story that Dr. Chow is telling about the unknown but highly skilled artisans in Canton, who, as she tells us, were practitioners of reproduction? Would visitors see through the iconography of Washington to think about the glass artifact itself and its craft? After all, the work of such portraits was precisely to hide the making in order to produce an image. In the reverse glass portrait of Washington, it was he who would have mattered and not the makers and their craft. But I think overall that the recent display really worked well to disrupt these dynamics with this sort of soft, dark lighting and the glass painting centrally positioned flat. And it invites a different kind of looking, a, a sort of thoughtful looking, I think, is invited by this darkened space that doesn't reify Washington, but asks people to think about the relationship between all the various objects. Um, in many ways, then, this display also reverses the usual dynamics of Washington portraits. Next slide, please. Of course, the history of race and slavery is highly pertinent to the glass reverse painting because we do need to think through what the figure of Washington means and the work that these portraits, glass and painted and printed, did and do in cultures that are designed to uphold and promote white supremacy. So we can see here in this painting by Trumbull that the expected order of things was for an enslaved person to be to the side in service of the white Washington. In typical fashion, and there are many of these portraits, um, you know, throughout Europe with, with a, a, a serving figure, enslaved figure to the side. In typical fashion, the dark skinned enslaved person is in the shadows and William Lee, which is uh, the, the person's name, his positionality and colouring brings Washington into relief as he stands there surrounded in light. Lee's blackness makes Washington's whiteness, both in literal terms on the painting, but also in terms of mythology. And indeed, Dr. Chow has shown us the apotheosis paintings, which depicted Washington as a saint. Here, Washington is the hero. Lee is in service of him. And in fact, this painting was widely copied in Europe, famously by Valentine Green, who was engraver to the king in 1773. And just as an aside to uh, what we're discussing here, you know, mezzo tinting is a very well recognized form of validated reproduction in the West. And we know their names, John Raphael Smith is well known as a mezzo tinter and printmaker. And it was Charles Wilson Peel who produced the first print of George Washington in 1778. We know the names of these uh, artists um, who reproduced as mezzo tinters, but we do not know the names of the Chinese reverse glass painters. Um, and so we just keep thinking of these dynamics. Trumbull had served on Washington's staff as an aide to camp early in the Revolutionary War. And he, in fact, painted this portrait from memories years, years later. So again, the idea of originality is already in question. Um, it was the first authoritative depiction of Washington that was available in Europe. And Lee was one of many enslaved people who was owned by Washington, eventually freed by his will. But this is also part of the false mythology of the founding fathers, that they were bringers of freedom when in fact they were owners of enslaved people. Often these people were their own children, as with Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings children. What is less known, however, is that Washington also likely fathered a child with an enslaved young woman named Venus. And this history, which is an oral history transmitted via the Bryant family, still awaits the DNA evidence that corroborated the claims of Jefferson's descendants. Linda Bryant claims that her fifth, fifth grandfather, West Ford, was Washington's son with Venus and tells her story in her book, I Cannot Tell a Lie, the true story of George Washington's African-American descendants. This is a fictionalized version of the research that is underpinned by doctoral research. Um, eventually, West Ford would use the land that he did inherit from the Washington family to settle newly freed homeless African-Americans after the Civil, Civil War. Uh, and that's part of Gum Springs in Virginia. Now, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association have consistently refused to give a sample of DNA that would prove the claims in another way, one way or another. <clears throat> 
And so that story is dismissed. And Venus, a real woman who was sent by Hannah Washington to comfort Washington when he was ill, remains relatively unknown and in the shadows. When museums display Washington, we have to ask ourselves what stories are reinforced and which stories are silenced. Next slide, thank you. These dynamics are important to bear in mind when we come to look at the portrait of Washington that is at the centre of past, what well, the beginning of the past and present, because we ask what can curation and exhibi exhibitions do to unsettle dominant narratives. In this case, the Chinese glass painters must be centred, but so too must we also unsettle the powerful iconographic work that the images of Washington do, signifying as they do an unblemished. Uh, reputation. That's the word that the Mount Vernon Ladies Association say. They want Washington's reputation to remain unblemished. Um, okay, now the next slide. To underline and to conclude that what is at stake in histories of glass and the significance of this particular material, this glassy, glossy, polished material that um, Christopher Maxwell talked about last year in the seminar last year. We can return to a very recent event that just happened. Um, Lizzo, the very popular musician and pop star, claimed that um, this event made history. On September the 28th, 2022, Lizzo was invited to the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. by librarian Carla Hayden, who's also a black woman, to come and look at their collection of historic flutes. She did this because she knows that Lizzo is a trained classical flautist. Lizzo played a particular lead crystal glass flute made for James Washington by Claude Laurent, who faceted and made a silver joint engraving, especially to commemorate Madison's second inauguration. Now, what I found interesting when I looked into this was that this flute is tied to George Washington and another story of a portrait of him being also rescued from damage. Um, you can go on to the next slide. It is well known that Dolly Madison rescued a now iconic portrait of George Washington as she fled the White House on August the 24th. It was the Gilbert Stuart portrait um, on August 24th, 1814, just before British troops set fire to Washington, DC. Less well known um, is the exact, is what other object she brought, but um, it's thought that she brought this flute out. <laughs> so she rescued the portrait of Washington and Laurent's crystal flute. Unlike the anonymous glass painters in, China, in Canton, Laurent could patent his craft, which he did. This is a precious object and its crystalline qualities were regarded as suitable commemoration for a white US president and all the mythology that is associated with him and others. Madison was also an enslaver. He did not free his slaves via his will, and he also raped enslaved women and fathered children whom he kept in slavery. One example is Mandy, a woman who was captured in Ghana and who came into Madison's ownership. Again, these stories remain hidden in the archives while the crystal fruit comes to the fore. But again, this is not the history that um, a white-centric view wants us to remember. And what I want us to think about is the degree to which the materiality of glass symbolizes this, this purity that's associated with whiteness. Thomas Jefferson himself became very interested in the sound of musical glasses, and he described it as angelic. Final slide, thank you. And so for Lizzo to play Madison's crystal flute reverses in every way these stories and their ideologies. Lizzo was classically trained, she played the Laurent flute expertly, even angelically, in the Library of Concert and at her own concert later, dressed in a gold sparkling bodysuit. The right commentariat was outraged and declared this a violation. Matt Walsh said she was desecrating American history. Ben Shapiro accused her of deliberately provoking the US public. The Columbia Bugle called it a humiliation ritual. Greg Price said that Lizzo had degraded our history, and we have to ask whose history is, is here. Black women are not supposed to acquire such accomplishments, are not supposed to have access to archives, are not supposed to declare as she did to her many fans, we just made history. Of course, many and mostly curators, librarian, 
activists and archivists have been very loud in their support for Lizzo playing the flute. And in fact, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association yesterday invited her to come and do it again there. So I want us to leave, leave us with the idea that it was a particularly a glass flute being handled and played by a large black woman that has so riled white nationalists because glass and its transparent visual rhetoric do become synonymous with the putative qualities of Washington and others. Lizzo reversed these with artistry and joy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carrie and Maggie, for these um, thought provoking uh, presentations. I, I needed to take a moment just to um, hear, listen, own uh, what, what was just presented to us and, and continues to be a challenge. I think, uh, as Carrie and Maggie mentioned, uh, both were consultants to us, as were a number of about 40 other uh, people in, in producing the exhibition that we have on view at the museum right now, um, that tries to probe deeper into objects, what they represent, who they represent, um, and uh, what we, we can, um, ask ourselves and others uh, about these objects and, and their place in um, cultural heritage institutions. Um, I did wanna turn though, we have a few minutes left, not too many, uh, but there are a few questions in the chat that I, I would very much like uh, to ask. Um, uh, the first is from um, a soon to be new colleague of ours, Julie Balamar will be joining uh, the museum in a couple of weeks as our new curator of early modern glass. And I'm delighted that she's with us today in seminar. And she has a question for Maggie. Um, she says, do you see any continuities between reverse glass painting and the advent of the early technologies of photography in China? And she continues, are we seeing similar replication mechanisms and centrality of the glass plate, of course, glass plates in early photography, very active, um, to the reproducibility of the image? That's a great question. Thanks, Julie. Um, this uh, reverse glass painting technology in China developed before, well before photography would have been introduced. So even though the watch Washington portrait is just a few decades earlier from, you know, uh, from the introduction of photography, the kind of height of the um, reverse glass paintings in Canton were, were 18th century examples. Um, so because it's so early, I'm not sure that um, there has been any work or uh, on linking those two technologies, though, as you say they would have both relied on plate glass, but I think by the time that photography would have been introduced, um, there would have been a, a domestic means of, of, re, of producing plate glass, which was not the case for the 18th century, like glass was imported in order to be painted, which I think makes a difference because it was this associated with a kind of foreign material that was novel, whereas by the 19th century, it would have been very commonplace in China to for, for glass panels in general. Great, thank you. Um, and then there's another question uh, again for Maggie, other than prints, would there be sources of color scheme provided for the Canton reverse glass painters? You know, if they're working from a black and white print, how are they getting the yeah. colors? I know, I often wonder this myself. Um, I'm not a scholar, print scholar. So I, I actually asked this question, posed this question to colleagues who are print scholars, because I wondered, you know, were these prints that were brought to China just colored? Because there was a, a culture of coloring prints in some, some cases. Um, but it, it seems that in the 18th century, many of the European examples, it was unlikely to have been colored. That coloring prints was kind of, and, and colored prints were, uh, you know, popular later. Um, so I think a lot of the coloring may have been either invented or, you know, dictated, like, you know, uh, uh, someone who commissioned a print uh, copy may have, you know, made suggestions of like what they would want, um, or they were just sort of imagined, because you do see examples in which the coloring is different, you know, there'll be like multiple examples of the same composition and different color, color schemes would have been used. Thank you. And then uh, the last question that's in the chat, um, although there are many more on my page and surely in the minds of everyone here, um, and the question is asked is, were all hinterglass paintings made in China? 
No, they weren't. So um, there was a, a long tradition of painting on glass that actually is European, and it was actually very much focused, uh, uh, based in places that were glass making centers. So, um, you know, glass production towns had a tradition of painting on glass. Um, the, they tend to be um, in comparison to the Chinese examples, they tend to be a little bit less detailed. So they're almost like a folk art uh, of these glass making regions. And you can see lots of examples if you look them up, like many, many European examples of painting on glass. Um, it's also related to a kind of uh, print production on glass, but I don't know as much about that tradition, which is a kind of um, a, a sort of Relate, related to uh, print reproduction in, in, in Europe. Wonderful. Um, I am afraid we have run out of time. Um, I've spent an incredibly uh, enriching uh, talk by both of you. And I thank you very much uh, from everyone at the Corning Museum of Glass and indeed from everyone here in seminar. Thank you very much. I encourage everyone to step into a community room in the, in the break and we'll return um, for the uh, afternoon keynote at one o'clock this afternoon, Eastern time. Thank you, everyone.